the praise too. You can shout amen and hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. We thank God for those of you that are joining us in person. I'm telling you, there is a blessing in the press. Um, I want to mention something about that real quick. Um, before I do that, uh, I also want you to join me in a round of applause for those people that are joining us online. Let's give a hand praise and a hearty shout of amen for those people. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank God for those of you joining us online. And uh, we're grateful to know that the word is a blessing to you, that it is a support to you. Amen. Now, I want to say this. I don't want to be religious about this church attendance thing. Okay. Now, the way I grew up and we're going to receive our offering, I just I'm learning how to adjust to this new schedule. So you got to bear with me. Glory be to God. I'll get it sooner or later. Um, but when I grew up in the church, we were taught emphatically, in, in, and particularly in the Holiness Church, that serious saints came to church. That, that's what we were taught. And I mean, it was drilled to, in us in a way that said that, hey, if, the per, if a Christian is not consistently coming to church, that's how you know they're either not saved or they backslid or they're not living right. And uh, I think that it was drilled so much that you had two dynamics. You had uh, a fear-based uh, sort of uh, reaction to it, to where people, even if they weren't serious about the Lord, would still come to church just to save face, all right? And then I think that um, there were people that were just over the years have been offended by that and has caused people to rebel. Now, my stand concerning that is the stand of the word. The Ecclesia Church, the most powerful group, is the group that gathers, all right? There is a blessing when you press out to be in the presence of other believers, and statistically, you'll notice that a believer that doesn't have a fellowship with other believers consistently doesn't belong to a church home will struggle more than the average Christian. So that's why we push for that. But now on the other hand, we don't want to bash and condemn people. Here, you broke your foot right before service time and you're in the hospital and 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 just, uh, you got somebody calling you like, how have you backslid? My brother, my sister didn't see you in church today. We don't want that dynamic and we don't want it to be a pressure point it it are you the better for coming to church yes but you got to know that i don't uh, i don't take a roll call every sunday man i don't do it i still get people to call me and say pastor i won't be there this sunday I say god bless you you know but i will say that uh, the people that press out tend to receive more of the blessing uh, let me the lord just spoke this to me before i came out if you have a job that keeps you out of church on your church days, ask the Lord to change it. He'll do it. You don't have to force it. Just believe God and he'll do it. We've had that happen in here, ain't we? Glory be to God. We have multiple people that that's happened for and he'll do it. May not happen overnight, but he will do it. Amen? All right. Uh, I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to worship the Lord concerning our giving. Uh, for those of you that are joining us online uh, if you would like to be a part of, the, of today's offering, uh, you can go on awfc.org. Those of you on Facebook, you'll also see that posted, I believe, shortly. You will see that option posted as well on YouTube uh, for many different options there. And uh, we're going to worship the Lord concerning our giving. Those of you that are willing, I'm going to ask you to get a point of contact. A point of contact is... is an object that represents the releasing of your faith directly to the Lord. And we're going to worship the Lord concerning our giving. Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for an opportunity uh, to have, uh, for having been translated out of lack into uh, promise, out of Egypt into Canaan, where we increase continually and the blessing is working for us. We honor you as your very own children. And uh, we're grateful to have the opportunity to...
to give to the work of the Lord. Now, Jesus, we come before you and we confess that we've not been manipulated concerning our tithe and our offering, but that we are giving willingly. It is our pleasure and our heart is in it. And uh, we ask you to take our seed, our offering, and our tithe to the Father and worship him on our behalf. Bless him, thank you, Lord Jesus, for our benefit. Amen. And as that's done right now, we claim the rights of the word of God, which declares that we have tithers' rights, that the windows of heaven are open to us, the blessing is poured out in overflow, that the devourer is rebuked. For our sake, that we won't lose and that our harvest will come into us unhindered in the name of Jesus. I want you to repeat this after me in Jesus' name. My heart and my faith is in my giving. My words agree with your word, Lord. As I've given, it will be given to me. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. In Jesus' name, come on, give the Lord a praise for that, if you believe it. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may have your seats. I'm going to switch over here to my other mic, my brother. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right, right before we release the children, we are going to... Um, uh, conduct uh, our graduate ceremony briefly for those folks that have graduated more classes. Now I tell you, my heart is with the people that take and graduate these classes. We said in the very beginning of this ministry, I said in the very beginning, I said the people that take these classes and complete them will prosper. And that is exactly what has happened. Amen. So we want to honor you today. I'm going to ask our graduates to come up. I'm going to ask you to hold your applause until everyone is up. And uh, we're going to start off. Are these in order here uh, for the classes? We're going to start off. Uh, first of all, we're going to have uh, Sister Tressa actually come up here and stand um, to my left. Let's give her a round of applause. Uh, I want to say I thank God for Sister Tressa where these classes are concerned. She has been the epitome of faithfulness. I, as it relates to Sister Tressa and what she oversees, I thank God I do not have to worry about her getting the job done. She does it with her heart. The Bible says give honor to whom honor is due. She de deserves honor. Let's give her a hand praise for that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. She absolutely deserves honor and she no matter how much I put on her plate she just keeps taking it she doesn't complain she still smiles even when it hurts and I know it hurts sometimes but she still take it glory to God and she has been faithful to these classes and uh, she will and I want to announce this uh, actually uh, she doesn't even know this yet and uh, she will have staff under her but uh, we're going to transition, and uh, Sister Tressa will oversee every resource class in this church at some point. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise for that. Is it okay? Are you going to hate or are you going to congratulate? Where you go? Are you going to hate? Is that what you're going to do? you got to learn how to celebrate somebody else. Glory be to God. I tell you, church people, boy, have mercy. We celebrate you, sis. Glory be to God. We celebrate you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Love you guys so much. The Lord rewards the faithful. And uh, we look to eventually, I don't know if you guys know, but this ministry will turn into a full-time operation at some point where there is full-time staff here. Amen? Come on, give the Lord a praise for that. You received that? You don't know it yet, but they're already, we already have staff, and there is a degree of payroll already taking place in this church in the form of seed uh, for the sowing that the people do with their time and their efforts and their gifts, 
and it will increase. I want those of you on staff that as this ministry increases, you will increase. Amen. Do you receive it? Well, don't be happy about it. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. I thank God for that. And we are looking to build out each ministry. So, uh, Sister Tressa being over these classes, it will not be for her to do all the work. She will oversee them and she will have people under her, staff under her that will support, that will report to her concerning each one of these classes and that will move on throughout the entirety of the ministry. Amen? Amen. Thank God for her. All right, now uh, let's uh, move forward. I'm, as I call your name, I want you to come up and stand to my right, starting at the Christmas tree here and work your way over. And it's not Xmas, it is Christmas. Glory Amen. to God. It's not the holiday, it is Christmas. Glory to God. Amen. All right, let's start with Ecclesia Institute. We're going to have, um, actually, let's uh, start with, are these all Ecclesia? Okay. Actually, let's start with milk class. Uh, let's start with Treasia uh, Hopkins. Come on down. Stand right there for me. Hold your applause, and we will get everybody up. Uh, let's also, Brother Thomas Eads. Glory be to God. Is he here? He's not here today. We will get his to him. Uh, also, Sister Lori Smith, glory be to God. I would imagine they're probably watching online, right? Or will watch online at some point. <laughs> glory be to God. Congratulations to you. That's Sister Lori and Brother Thomas, right? That, that's together. Glory to God. I do know who y'all are. I do. Okay. Uh, also, okay, we did this one. Just, just we won't call that one again. We already did it. No more, glory to God. And then uh, uh, also, is that the only one for milk there? Yeah. Okay. And uh, also, is, do you have the other ones or did I put them over here already? <laughs> and mercy, Albert. Okay. All right. So the only ones I have here for actual milk class graduates today is um, Sister uh, Lori, Brother Thomas, and Trey Asia. Okay, now you can give them a hand. Hey Amen. Really briefly, I want to say I thank God. I want to start off with Sister Trey Asia. Uh, Sister Trey Asia, it's amazing from what I've seen. And again, I repeat, I won't always be able to do this in person the same way where I know something about the person's life. Why won't I always be able to do that? Because we're going to grow. And what am I doing? Am I saying that by what? Faith. By faith. Glory yeah. be to God. You, can I live? Yeah. Can, I, can I grow? Yeah. Thank you. I receive it. Have mercy. And, uh, but while I can, it is a pleasure. And I despise not the small beginning of being able to tell you face to face that it has been an absolute privilege to see your transformation. That you came here. Some people, if you were called when this uh, sister came here at this church, she brought somebody else to church to hear the gospel, hoping that they would get saved, and then was called out by the Holy Ghost and informed that she herself was not saved. Do you know how many people we've seen get offended and leave because of that? Yes. Instead of getting offended, well, not a whole lot. <laughs> but instead of getting offended and leaving, you just took it, glory be to God, and said, what shall I do to be saved, glory be to God? Come on, give the Lord a Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And immediately got saved and uh, just watching your growth and watching you pull for your family and your loved ones and believe God for them has been amazing. There are people that are sitting here in this church now because of you, and that is phenomenal. Uh, I want to congratulate you for completing milk class, and uh, we believe that your salvation and understanding of it is complete. It is ironclad and to never be undone. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's give her a hand, praise, congratulations. Amen. Glory be to God. Okay, I want you to come over here and to uh, Sister Trey Asia. Come on, come on back up. 
I want you to come over here to Sister um, Tressa. Here is a gift going to glory be to God. Bless your teacher. Have mercy. And, and go on and stand right over there. Go, Chelsea. Go and get her standing right there. Just stay right there. Have mercy. Okay. Uh, now, we're moving over to, oh, wait a minute. Uh, Brother Thomas Eads and uh, Sister Lori Smith are going to talk about these two together. I know they're online. Uh, somebody make sure they go, or they will be, make sure they go back and watch this. I want to say it has been wonderful watching the transformation that has taken place uh, in you. I have, when Jesus touched the woman with the issue of blood and felt virtue come out of him, Brother Thomas, I want you to know I had that exact experience concerning you. I felt virtue leave my body and go in to your physical body. You hang on to that. It was real. Glory be to God. You are saved. You are forgiven. And the word is and will work for you. Amen. Let's give a hand to Brother Thomas Eads. Glory to God. Woo-wee. You're going to light the kingdom on fire. Glory be to God. Amen. And also, Sister Lori Smith. Sister Lori Smith has exemplified what we used to call in the old uh, holiness church, somebody who was sweetly saved. Sweetly saved. That means they just came in with no fuss, no fight, and no demands, just grateful and receiving. Boy, that kind of make you want to keep on preaching. When they come in like that, glory be to God. And I know everybody doesn't come in like that, but she did, and we're grateful for it. Sister Lori, we love you, we appreciate your spirit, and we congratulate you for completing milk class. Let's give them both a hand. <coughs> I want those two to know that we love you, and you have a family here at AWOFC. Amen? Amen. All right, and we have uh, some Zoom Zooms and Wham Wams for you when you get back, Lord be to God. But I don't know how long those uh, nothing but cakes last. You better hurry up, glory to God. Or we can send them home. We'll send them home. All right, moving right on to um, our next level class uh, here in this ministry, uh, referred to as Ecclesia Institute. Ecclesia Institute is the resource uh, course that helps you learn and understand the importance of coming to church. Why we come to church, the origin of church, the word church means ecclesia is translated. Uh, the word translated church is the Greek word ecclesia, and it is the gathered assembly of appointed, powerful, influential people. I emphasize that gathers. And so those of you that have gone through this class, you are demonstrating that you have an understanding that coming to church is important, that is connected to your destiny and your wholeness, and we appreciate you taking the time to get an impartation of that information, and we want to honor you on today. I want to have, first of all, uh, let's see here, Sister Treasia, come on down again. <laughs> now, did she get two cakes or one? Okay. We're going to have to pray about it and see. Glory <laughs> to God. And sister, um, and again, Sister Treasia, same thing. Uh, I think it is honorable to see you classes, eating up everything that you can. Keep going. Keep receiving. Keep learning. Keep growing. Amen. Amen. Congratulations. Here is your certificate. By the way, let me read this certificate. By the way, I did forget that. A certificate of graduation that certifies Treasure Hopkins is recognized for a completed and graduated anointed word of faith, woo -woo, Ecclesia Institute, on December 4th, 2022. Class host, Tressa Cervantes, Pastor Al Cooper, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. Let's give her a hand one more time. Yeah. Amen. You can. Go back over there. And also, uh, for Ecclesia Institute, our next graduate is Tondria Benton. Come on down. The price truly is right. Glory be to God. It only costs you your soul. Have mercy. Uh, Sister Tondria, 
I, I think it is awesome. Again, I want to say the same thing to a degree that uh, I've had the privilege uh, in the beginning here to watch you come into this church and submit yourself to the Lord. I've watched you make adjustments that were difficult. I've watched you make adjustments and uh, as I challenge uh, a lot of people, if you're one-on-one -on -one with me, at some point I'm going to challenge you to change. And I can recall challenging you and seeing you accept the challenge and make the transition. And as a result, the Lord is blessing you. Amen. Glory be to God. And we believe he's going to continue to bless you. We want to recognize you for having uh, completed Ecclesia Institute, demonstrating an understanding of the necessity of church and church attendance. And even through your work schedule, you have pressed and believed God, and it's getting better and better. Amen? Amen. Glory be to God. Come on, let's give her a round of applause as well. Sister Tundra, we absolutely, if I haven't said this before, we absolutely consider you a vital part of the AWOFC family. We appreciate you and your family. We love you guys. And uh, we are glad to have the privilege to walk with you and your destiny in the kingdom. Amen? Amen. We love Amen. you. Come on, let's give her a hand praise one more time. Sister Tondre, this certificate of graduation certifies Sister Tondre Benton is recognized for completing and graduating Anointed Word of Faith Ecclesia Institute on December 4, 2022. Tressa Cervantes, class host, Pastor Al Cooper, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. Amen. Come on, let's give all of our graduates a hand. And there is your zoom, zoom, and wham, wham right there. Glory to God. And um, it's interesting, nothing but cakes, by the way. Uh, the company that Chelsea and I own is actually partnered with nothing but cakes. Amen. So we thank God for those folks. And they're willing to partner with us even when we were in our infancy. Amen. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to move right along and get ready to go into the word. Uh, I also would like to uh, uh, dismiss our children. You may go. And uh, let's get that heat down just a tiny bit. If you don't mind, it's a little hot in here, Jesus. All right. You got time for some word? Just a little bit of it? What's my threshold? Glory be to God. Well, don't answer that question. All right, as we are standing, um, let's prepare to go before the Lord in prayer and we'll move forward. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity uh, to, to feed on the word and uh, to receive revealed knowledge. Now, Lord, I know that there are those in here that need a rhema word, a right now answer for their specific situations. Lord, I know that under the sound of my voice, there may be those that are uh, discouraged, those that are burdened and heavy laden. But Lord, I thank you that you are for people just like that in those situations. And I believe that same anointing is resting on me to speak life into those situations and give those people something to say. Now, I pray, Lord, that you would cause this word to come through me in excellence, accuracy, and boldness, that the eyes of the understanding of those who hear are enlightened, that this word is confirmed with wonders and miracles in those who hear. Satan, I break your power and cancel your assignment. I decree this word shall come forward unhindered by you in any way. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, give the Lord a shout of amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may have your seats. Thank you, Lord. Uh, could somebody, um, Brother Ishmael, I need you to grab a pen out of my office here. Or back there is fine. Yeah. You can grab one back there for me. All right. I want you to uh, turn over 
Uh, really quick before we thank you, sir. Before we do that, uh, Brother Ishmael, come up here for a second. Uh, you know, the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Yep. And that redeemed is not just when you get saved. That's what happens to you even after you get saved. you believe that? I believe it. Now, it takes boldness to do that. Are you bold? Uh, I'm pretty bold. You got some boldness? <laughs> yeah. Said, I'm working on it. Go I'm working God. on it. It's kind of hard to Listen, in front of people. We want to celebrate with you based off of what took place uh, to you recently. Uh, and I just believe this. I like to tell, if I find a quarter on the ground, I like to get on the rooftop and shout about it like I found $10,000 going to God. Amen. And so I am a, a, a huge fan of that. Um, would you, are you comfortable with sharing what happened today? Oh, the yeah. news you got today? Well, it was this week. It was this week. It okay. was earlier this week. Go ahead and, uh, so, go ahead and share that with us. Earlier this week, um, so I have been, like, trying to get my parole officer to meet with me. So then they pushed me on to another parole officer. And I've been on parole for, like, two years now. And I wasn't supposed to, I wasn't supposed to be on parole that long. I was only supposed to be on for right there. about a year. So, for like two years I've been fighting with parole, in and out of halfway houses, you know, for nothing that I, you know, no crime that I committed, but I also wasn't living right for God. So, like, you know, I was susceptible to different things that, that the world was, you know, the laws of the world, you know, were on, you know, on. So, uh, so the, I've been trying to uh, get a hold of my parole officer. And uh, she wouldn't answer the phone or anything. And I'm like, man, I've, I've heard stories, you know, about people, they're not being able to get a hold of their parole officer. Mm. And then their parole officer telling them that you're violated because they couldn't get a hold of them. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So I was going through all that. So finally, someone, I called up there and I was like, listen, my name is Ishmael Gonzalez. I've been trying to get a hold of my parole officer for like two months now. And uh, and I want to know who is my parole officer. And I'm like, hold on, we'll we'll check for you. I'm like, all right. So I get I get on uh, they, I get her her name and number, and I send I call her. Well, they don't answer the phone. She don't answer the phone. And already the devil is in my head. Like, man, it, it's 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 going bad. Mm. But then then I I I, I rebuke that and I said, no, nope, I'm gonna rejoice. It's gonna happen. Everything's oh gonna go good. You know what I'm saying? So. So then I called my, uh, so while I was saying that, I was standing in agreement with Alethea, we were talking, and I was like, hold on, babe, I got a call. And it says, P.O. Collins. And so I answered the phone, I was like, hi. And she's like, I'm your new parole officer. She says, don't worry, nothing is wrong. Uh, uh, I just put in your paperwork to let you off. Well, glory be to like, God. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so, did I, so then, um, so like, uh, well, like, I don't know, like, so I was, so I was waiting for like two weeks, three weeks. She said, call me right after Thanksgiving. Well, I called her before and she's like, uh, she's like, well, well, we, I put the paperwork in, but I haven't heard anything. I was like, all right, that's fine. I said, just, just get a hold of me when you can. So Thanksgiving went by and then just, uh, what, I think it was two Monday or Tuesday. I, I, I got I gotta get that down. But uh, I get I get a, I get a, uh, I get a call from her, and she said, "Mr. Gonzalez," she said, "They approved your early uh, termination on uh, parole successfully, and that uh, you uh, you also uh, you don't have to come up here. We're just going to send you a piece of paper saying that you've been a, you know in an email." She said, "I haven't got the paper yet, but you're approved, and I'm going to send you the email." She said, "I'll probably send it to you tomorrow." I was like, "All right, that's fine. That's great." So I call my family and all that. Well, later on that day, she sends me an email and says, here's your paper, here's your release for parole, and you don't have to see nobody or nothing, and now I'm a free person on parole. Glory well, be to God. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. Come on, come on, come on. Glory well, be to God. You cannot tell me that if you won't just continually stick with the Lord that he won't come through for you. He will come through for you. You're looking at an individual that was in prison. I mean, 
Mama Gracie, how many times have we prayed him out of jail? <laughs> Multiple times. And didn't the Lord do it? Glory be to God. And do you see his heart? It's a real heart. Do you see it? Glory be to God. Come on, let's celebrate with our brother. Let's give a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Congratulations. Glory be to God. Now, I tell you what. God is in the miracle working business. Amen. Everybody should be seeing testimonies and having stories where God has done the impossible in your life and in your situation. Amen. Amen. I want you to keep believing until you get it. Do you receive that? Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Ooh, that news just makes me want to run. I need to run, too. Glory be to God. I'm Duke. Have mercy. All right. Uh, turn over with me uh, really briefly back to um, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to pick back up at what I'm going to call our focal point verse here in verse 2. Uh, we have been in a series for the entirety of this year based off of the theme that the Lord gave us at the beginning of 2022. And the name of that year or this year has been um, taking possession. And we understood that the idea of taking possession is to receive the things that the Lord uh, has already done for us, and we will continue to do that, and uh, that will not change. But that having been announced gave us a target, gave us a goal, and set a momentum for the year. Amen? And uh, those of you that have uh, placed your faith in that and followed after that in 2022, what should have happened is you should have taken possession of some things. Amen? Amen. Did anybody get possession of things? Yeah. Well, what we just heard, that's possession. Yeah. Yeah. You took something that the Lord already gave to you and it manifested. Amen? Amen. Now, going into the year uh, 2023, uh, I want to announce again, I know you guys have seen the promo. Uh, by the way, uh, let's give a hand to our media team for that promo. Right. Yeah. Glory to God with Sister Tressa did a great job there. Yeah. And the Lord spoke to me at the last minute. He said, Al, get a promo up for that. We want to get people prepared for that. But in 2023, and this is not the message today, but I told you that I would announce what the year 2023 was about. 2023 will be the year of divine assistance. The year of divine assistance. And I won't go into much of that now, but there is a level of assistance that kicks in in the kingdom of God after you have done all that you know to do, and that we have to put our faith uh, in line with that and expect that to happen. And I believe in 2023, we're going to see assistance in a way that we have never seen before. Do you believe that? Amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise for that Hallelujah. if you have an expectation of it. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, uh, i got to table that because uh, that is what we will be teaching uh, we will be actually preaching. Uh, that night will be an actual sermon. Go figure. Glory be to God. We'll be teaching. It'll be an actual, what I am hoping to be, a, a prophetic word from the Lord. And uh, we look forward to you joining us. Uh, that uh, service will be uh, live as well. We're going to praise and worship. We expect, and I'd like you to be praying in advance for a move of the Lord for that night. We want to see people healed, delivered, set free, and uh, the word confirmed by signs, wonders, and miracles. We will be also taking communion. We won't force manifestation in a service like this, 
and, but we are going to pray and uh, uh, inquire of the Lord and uh, believe God so that the gifts of the Spirit manifest that night. Amen? Amen. I want you to be mindful of that. We will have uh, some refreshments as I understand it. And a service will end at exactly midnight. That service starts at 1230. Is that correct? Or 930. Is that right? So it will end at exactly midnight. So we want you to uh, be prepared for that. Amen. All right. Um, in Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to transition over into um, a little bit further in the text we've been studying. And I want to call this particular teaching Correction and the Blessing. Correction and the Blessing. I think this is befitting. Uh, Brother, Annou Brother uh, Copeland announced at the beginning of this year that one of the focal points of this year would be the year of correction. And I want to talk about how correction and being able and willing to receive it is connected to pulling down the benefits of the blessing. And it's something that I think has been a taboo sort of subject, particularly in faith circles where on both sides, I believe the preachers have been scared to preach it because of fear of offending the people. And I think the people have been afraid to hear it because in the church, we've been abused for a long time. We've been abused and we've been the preaching, a lot of us have, has, have dealt with a dogmatic preaching that constantly tells you that you're not enough, that you'll never get it right, that you'll never be able to do it. So we want to talk about a balance concerning that. Is, should correction have a balance to it? Yes. But do we throw out the necessity of it? Necessity of it? Absolutely not. It's needed and uh, it has a biblical foundation. We're going to talk about that because if we can uh, navigate correction right here, the blessing will literally overtake us. You can make this, I can, I'd like to make the statement and say what is in between you and breakthrough often is correction. Correction, the necessity of changing courses, acknowledging um, transitions, uh, that need to be made. Amen? Now, again, I don't want you to take this as bad news. And I want to say that just because I'm preaching it doesn't mean that I am exempt from it. As a matter of fact, everything that is preached in this church is always to me first. And I am always, my attitude is always, Lord, I need to be able to do this and then preach it to your people. Uh, I am first partaker of this. And I have never, ever, one time in the history of this ministry preached anything to you that I am not willing to swallow and uh, apply to my life. Amen? Amen? Glory be to God. So, now, we left off, by the way, these glasses are because I'm in front of a computer screen. Glory be to God. Eyes are good. Amen? They're great. It's just, there's a, what do you call this? There's a... These are made for computer screens. You got that? So you don't got to pray for my eyes. They're, they're doing good. I appreciate you concern, but they're, but they're great. Glory be to God. Now, now if they weren't, uh, I'd still act like they were good. Glory be to God. And believe God till I got manifestation. Now, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Uh, I want to read this verse, and I'd like you to read it with me. And uh, on the count of three, one, two, three. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, let's stop, let's start, let's start over again. Let's, let's, wait, I'll wait till you're ready. Are you ready? Can we read it together? Let's read this in unison on the count of three, okay? One, two, three. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, if we be honest, this is one of those 
churchy kind of scriptures, man, that when you hear it, it's just in your mind, everything goes gray, clouds, and fog. If we just be honest, like this, it, it, it just sounds like something that only those super saints that have it all together uh, would quote or talk about and uh, doesn't seem to really have much in it that really reaches out to the average Christian that speaks to them and says, hey, there is a benefit here. There is power right here, and it's for my situation. Now, we've been talking about this scripture. We've made some headway concerning this in Bible study. So we really jumped into this heavily on Monday in Bible study, and we uncovered some things concerning Jesus in the Old Testament. And we've got to deal with that some more. Sometimes I have to keep preaching these things over and over until I get a release from the Lord that we've got it. Sometimes that release from the Lord is signifying that I myself have it. Majority of the time it's for the church, but oftentimes there are things that the Lord says, Al, you keep preaching this till you get it. After you preach it on Sunday, you go back. When you're on the airplane, you turn it on in your ears and you listen to this entire teaching over again when you get in your hotel you listen to it again throughout the week when you get into your study prior to the next service you listen to it again you look at these scriptures you digest this thing and that thing begins to grow up in me and i start to believe it all right because i get a revelation of it now <clears throat> the church is often growing with the pastor. So, you know, I reserve the right to grow. Did you know that? Everybody reserves the right to continue to grow. Nobody has reached the mountaintop. Everybody is always a work, what? In progress. And uh, one person uh, made the statement to Brother Hagen. Brother Hagen had mentioned something in regards to his growth. You got to understand, in his day, Brother Hagen was almost looked at like a manifestation of Jesus himself. The body of Christ had never really seen anybody that up close and person, personal, personable, tangibly demonstrate the power of God and teach it at the same time. We, we've not, hadn't really seen that in this country before. And so he amassed a huge, huge following that really broke out worldwide. And the people that were close to him, like our partners, Brother Keith Moore, Brother Copeland, uh, so forth and so on, um, would at times he would admit and say, well, yeah, I, had to, I need to change this, or I messed it here, yada, yada, yada. And the people would be so shocked that one person made the statement, as I recall, I have to be careful about recalling their statement, so I am paraphrasing this, said, you need to correct something? You missed it? And his response was, can I grow? Can I grow too? I can grow, can I? Well, glory be to God. Nobody is above that. And I love that about the word of faith. That the word of faith is not the projection of perfect men that have never missed it, never had a mistake, and never flawed, but people that learn from their mistakes are corrected and keep growing. Glory be to God. I love that. That's the way I want to be for the rest of my life. I never want to act like uh, I don't need to learn and that I don't need to want to do that for the rest of my life. Amen? Now, <clears throat> we found out here concerning Jesus that Jesus was very active in the Old Testament. And particularly, we went over to uh, Genesis and we saw when Isaac was on the altar and Abraham, his father, was about to kill him, um, that... And there was an angel, which the scripture calls an angel of the Lord, 
that spoke out of heaven telling him to stop. And in the Hebrew, we found out that that angel had been deputized. That that angel was also a... Um, in the Hebrew, it's represented as a form of a manifestation of God himself. So this wasn't an average angel. It was a deputized God in deity that showed up to verify that faith had actually been legitimately used. Now, I want to clear up a verse that we've been quoting. In the beginning was the word. And John says this, and the word what? Was God, and the word was with God. And let's, let's back up. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. The statement of the word was God means that the word was a God deity. It's another word for deity. In the beginning was the word, and the word was a God deity. Referring to the Godhead. Referring to Jesus. He was the second member of the Godhead. That's who it was referring to. Okay? Now, here in uh, Hebrews, we've been talking about how not to faint when you're in well-doing. Now, saints, I tell you, Christianity isn't designed to be lived trying your best to get over into well-doing. Okay? And I think what happens in Christianity, particularly at the beginning of my saved life, I was initially born again in 1999. I was mentored by some very strong men of God. They loved their wives. They didn't cheat on their wives. They didn't practice sin. They didn't divorce their wives. They uh, believed what they preached and lived it. And uh, it just seemed the standard that they had was so much higher than anything I would ever be able to reach. And God knows I tried, man. I tried with everything in me trying to reach that standard. But there were some things missing that I didn't understand. And uh, I needed to understand the necessity of how to use my faith. Now, people have stumbled into results, but didn't learn how to get those results on purpose. So well, they've said, and the body of Christ says, hey, you need to be like me. But they've not been able to tell us how to get what they got. Because the case is that they stumbled into it, that uh, things happened uh, you know, and they have no idea how. It wasn't on purpose. Well, God wants the believer to live on purpose getting results. And uh, when I first got saved, you know, I was always trying hard and trying hard to get to a place to where I could qualify for scriptures like be not weary in well-doing. I'm like, man, I'm not weary in well-doing. I ain't done well yet. I mean... I'm struggling out here. I'm just trying to stay saved. I'm debating from week to week if I'm going to backslide. Glory be to God. Matter of fact, I thought about it this morning before I came to church and sat down on this piano. Glory be to God. I mean, it was that kind of dynamic. But when you live your life trying to get too well-doing, you miss so much. Well-doing is where you're supposed to start off in and maintain and grow in. Does that make sense? You are supposed to be laying aside from the very beginning what? The sin and the weight and the hindrance. And I tell you, still to this day, can I, can I be transparent here? I don't know what's going to happen in here. Jesus. Folks, you got to understand, I have compassion for the struggle. Do you understand that about me? You're not looking at a man that does not know what it is to struggle as a Christian. I have compassion 
for the in every church. Typically, there are those that are navigating this well-doing and that there are those that are still struggling with sin. And the thing about the sin, man, is it, it produces a condemnation to where you can never really focus on well-doing because your heart is always condemning you as a result of your sin. You know, so when you come to church, the word that's being preached is designed to get you over into taking territory and manifestation and dominating, you see? But when you're in that survival place of condemnation and sin, the guilt that's on you, it robs you from being able to hear anything else. Now, as a pastor, even though I know people are showing up to church with that dynamic, I still cannot preach just about snatching those Christians back out of sin. Do you understand that? I can't spend the time on Sunday mornings trying to get you over into a place to where you're not sinning. I have to give you the blueprint, and then you've got to do that blueprint, and that's the way you walk free of it. You, you see what I mean? Now, until you get, until you start walking in that thing, and when we're talking about things like well-doing, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be razzle for you to a degree. You know what I mean? And I get it. We have an unchurched church. People are newly saved. Even people online just getting saved. And sometimes I debate. Me and Chelsea talk about it. I say, maybe I need to go back to the very 100% basics of Christianity. Maybe I just need to go back to and preach the bare basics of salvation and victory that we have in Jesus and then go from there. And then I consult the Lord. He said, I can't do that because everybody in the church is not in that place. There are people in the church that are well doing. And there are people that are well doing that harvest is due for them. And that harvest that is due for them, a demand needs to be placed on it. And we place a demand on that harvest through the preaching and teaching, okay? So I want to say again, and I tell you, the sin, I tell you, folks, it vexes me. It, ve it vexes me. Do you understand? Yeah. I love you, but it vexes me. When the sin shows up on you, it hurts me like it hurts you. I can see it. We can, I can see it. Do you, understand? Do you believe that? I can see it. Did, walk free. Now, if you consistently stay in sin after you're born again, the case is not that you need to be delivered. Not in this church. The case is you are refusing to do what's been preached. There are no more hands that I could lay on you. I don't lay hands unless the Lord tells me to lay hands anyways. If he tells me to lay hands, I will. there are no more hands to lay on you. There's no, I don't, I don't counsel day in and day and night concerning sin. Where do you go in this church if you need to get free from sin? Romans 6.14. You go get that class and you listen to it over and over and over until you get it and you do it. Then you get over into this well doing. Can, are we clear on that? Can I move on past that? Can I kind of preach some good news in here? Now, we're using your faith is concerned, we've understood what faith is, right? Faith is the what? Sure. Substance. Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance of the things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. Substance, we've understood and emphasized heavily here, means assurance. Faith is being okay? Now, in this particular verse right here, the writer is saying, so that you don't get weary and miss your harvest, 
concerning those that are in well-doing. This is not concerning the sin struggle. In other words, I'm talking about in this text people that are engaged in well-doing. Not sinning is not a category of well-doing, at least not in this text. Are you with me? Amen. Sin is dead. Already has no dominion over you, right? right? We're not in your seat right now. When I'm preaching, if you're struggling with sin, there is word for you. But what I'm preaching right here is not necessarily for that. Can you accept that? Yes. Now, that's, that's, that's big boy action right there. Can you handle that? Okay, now, looking unto Jesus, that is better said looking unto the word, the author, or the beginning. Faith always starts with what? The word. Faith cannot exist without the word. Are you with me? You cannot have faith without a word first. Looking unto the word is the beginning of not feigning in well-doing. Looking unto the word is the beginning of not feigning, not becoming discouraged, not losing, not giving up, not becoming uh, not losing your spirit, so to speak. It starts with the word. So Paul says here, look unto the word first. Now, he describes something else about the word, and he describes it this way. I'm going to paraphrase this and say it this way. That Jesus is, that Jesus is the word, but the man Jesus the Savior Jesus is also the perfecter of your faith. Let me say that a different way. Jesus is or has been deputized to verify whenever legitimate faith has been demonstrated. Amen. For you as a believer, you start with the word, but... You have to demonstrate directly to Jesus that you believe it. Does that make sense? Man, I had to fight to get that out. Shut up, devil. I'm going to get this out. Don't care what you say. Glory be to God. You have to. There is an object of your faith. Your faith is not just out in the universe causing things to happen. That is a part of it. But there is a perfecter, a verifying officer, a deputy assigned to seal and verify that you are legitimately in faith. And that is the person of Jesus himself. Does that make sense? So, Christian, come up here for a second. Gonna help you out, glory be to God. I know you be working, you're gonna stay awake and here today, glory be to God. Brother Ishmael, come up here too for me. I gotta demonstrate this. Chris says it's almost time to go to work, eh? It's about that time. Did somebody say Uber? No, it's playing go with God. Have mercy. Now, watch this. Looking to the word right here is where it starts. I've got to go in there. We read a promise today. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. All promises or provisions are in the form of a covenant. That means there's God's side and his side. So my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What is our side of that covenant? To do what? What's this, what's, what do we got to do? We got to speak it. But what was the instruction in Philippians the fourth chapter leading up to that verse that we saw today. To give. That's how you qualify for that provision. You've got to sow to unlock that provision. Right? 
for that particular verse. Right. Yeah, yeah. My God shall supply all of your needs was written to a specific people that met a specific condition. Right. They were sowing into the work of the ministry, particularly Paul's ministry, right? Yep. It's a covenant matter. God will do his part. You'll have to do yours. Are you with me? That doesn't bother you, does it? No. I know that does away with, with uh, all things work together. But you got to get over that. You got to accept it. Okay? Now, it starts with the word. I need to start developing or apply faith to that word. The way I apply faith to it is by becoming assured of it, saying, and acting correspondingly to what it says. Again, back in Philippians 4, if I become assured of it, how do I become assured of it? By placing it where? In my eyes and my ears. What am I placing? I'm studying that chapter right there. I'm studying that chapter. Right? And as I'm studying it, investigating, then I run into the nugget. And I find out that there's a condition there. And that the condition is that I must what? That I must sow. So I put it in my eyes and my ears, and then I start saying it. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you supply all of my rent needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That you supply my marital needs according to your riches and glory of Christ Jesus. You supply my household needs, whatever it is, because it's all needs, right? Yeah. Now the part is going to come that I must act correspondingly to the instruction in that text. Yeah. Well, what if I don't see instruction? What if I don't see instruction? What do I need to do? Go back. You need to go back and keep investigating until you see instruction. Amen. Why is that? You're going to need instruction in order to act correspondingly to the word. And this instruction right here needs to be validated by Jesus himself. Are you getting that? Amen. The, the, instruct, the corresponding action is extremely important. This is what Abraham did up on that mountain. He didn't know what to do, but he knew that he had to have a sacrifice. So where there was no sacrifice, he understood, I still must demonstrate my faith, so I will make my own sacrifice by any means necessary. Well, when he corresponded in that action, then Jesus verified that faith had been demonstrated by actions. That's good. Are you with me? Amen. Now, stay right there. I won't have, I saw last week I had them stand up here a long time. I won't do you guys that way, so <laughs> just bear with me. Now, really quick, really quick, let me read this verse to you. In James chapter 2, verse 18. King James Version. Are you still here? Have you gone home? Yeah, I'm here. James chapter 2, verse 18. Now remember, my faith has to be demonstrated to who? Jesus. To Jesus. Let me read a statement right here concerning that. Fixing my eyes on the word by applying assurance, words, and corresponding action to it, while being mindful that I need to demonstrate straight to Jesus that I believe the word or promise I'm standing on. He is the perfecter and verifying deputy concerning my faith, right? Amen. Now, here's proof of that. Verse 18. Yea, a man may say, I have faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I want you to say this. Works, works means, means corresponding, corresponding action. action. Now let's, let's use that. Show me thy assurance 
without thy corresponding action. Now watch the rest of the verse. And I will show thee my assurance by my corresponding action. Assurance is shown by corresponding action. Faith is shown by corresponding action. We get that, right? To who? My corresponding action in any area, name an area, name an area that you may, one may be believing for. It doesn't have to be you. Name an area. Anybody. Finances. Finances. Give me another one. Health. 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 What else? Can I say it again? Career. Career. Restoration. Being restored. What else? Now watch this. Faith, healing, restoration. Or finances, healing, restoration. Let me start with restoration. Be restored now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Done Amen. deal. Done deal. You're already born again. Don't get into redoing that. Just be restored. Right. Repent. Be restored. Simple. Now, finances, career, healing, a little different. You're going to have to get involved in this. I have my word. I found it. I investigated it. And now I'm saying it. I'm saying it based off of what I found in my investigation. Right? Now I'm to the part of corresponding action. And my corresponding action is going to have to be shown to Jesus. Brother Church, come up here be Jesus right there. Stand right there in the front right there. You may have to manually move this camera if you can. The people at home have been complaining that they can't see certain things. If we can move it. There's some nice shoes right there, my brother. Have mercy. My wife told me I wore the wrong shoes with my suit today. I said, it's okay. I'm going to wear them again. Glow up in <laughs> now, I have the assurance of the word. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I got it through my investigation. In the process of my investigation, I got revelation. Revelation that, oh, this text or benefit applies to people that sow seed. Okay? Now, I'm going to have to demonstrate this. Which, number one, means I'm going to have to what? I'm going to have to get a seed. No way around it, I'm going to have to get a seed. And I'm going to have to give that seed... Now, it's awesome to know that there is an object for my faith. Good. Lord, help me say this the right yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. That I am demonstrating this to somebody. Yes. Not my good. church members. That is good. That is good. Not my pastor. I'm demonstrating this to the perfecter, yeah. to the deputizing God officer concerning my faith. Amen. And that is the person of Jesus. Amen. So I go to Jesus with my seed, and I said, Jesus, Lord, I decree that I am believing for my career, for direction concerning my career, concerning my healing, according to your word, to the word of God in Philippians. You said that you would supply all of my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And that I needed a seed. Here's my seed. Now, Jesus, I didn't. I sow this seed directly in your presence. Yeah, yeah. Take the seed to the Father. Worship Him on my behalf. Yeah. Here's my faith. It's wrapped up in this seed, and I demonstrate it. What if I just did this, Lord? You said in your word that you supply all my needs according to the riches of glory by Christ Jesus. Watch this. Lord, you said in your word that you supply my needs according to your riches and glory. Jesus. Oh, wow. 
I have it. I believe I receive it. Lord, you said that you would supply all my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What's going to happen? I'm going to stay right here. My miracle will not move. The miracle will not move without demonstration. Right. Because faith without corresponding action is what? Dead. Is dead. Now remember, Jesus cannot be tricked. Wow. He knows if real faith is there and when it is not. So you don't have time to worry about if other people think you're in faith. You've got to show Jesus that you believe it. The woman with the issue of blood, she said, if I can touch Jesus' garment, I'll be healed. Man, I need to touch you. Glory be to God. That's right. You need to always stay mindful that there is a verifying officer to your faith. There is an object looking to see if you really believe. It's not just Satan. It's Jesus himself. Are you with me? Okay, you can have a seat. Give the Lord a praise for that. Did we get that? Okay, man, I'm way over time. I got to move. I'm going to take these glasses off. I got to move. Now, watch this. Verse 3 in Hebrews. Go back to Hebrews 12, verse 3. Look what it says. For consider him. Oh, let me back up. Verse 2. He's the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy or the expectation of good things in front of him endured the cross. I want you to say this after me. Wait a minute. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Now watch this. I want you to repeat this. Endurance, Endurance. is the byproduct, the byproduct of, goal of goal setting and making adjustments. Endurance is the byproduct of goal setting and making adjustments. Now, if you're believing for something and you don't establish the goal in the beginning, you're going to give up. Satan will see to it that you give up. If you don't make adjustments that the Lord is telling you to make, if you don't Make the corrections that the Lord is telling you to make. You'll keep going around literally the same mountain. That mountain can last a lifetime, folks. Wow. You can spend your whole saved life going around the same mountain of poverty or depression or family issues or relationship issues. You have to make the adjustment to get around or over that mountain. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, I'm going to prove that. Look at verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Verse 5. Now here's where it gets interesting. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. Who is he talking to right here? He's talking to a congregation of people that were Jewish. That were aware of the Jewish law. They were aware of what was said to their forefathers when they were in the wilderness. And he's reminding them of this exhortation of what was told to their forefathers all the way back then. Watch this. My son, despise. What does me feigning have to do with correction? What does correction have to do with my harvest? 
Are you still here? Or have you gone home? Can you take a little, just a little bit more? Yes. Now watch. Ye forgotten the exhortation which speaketh to you as unto children. My son despised not the chastening of the Lord, nor fate when thou art rebuked of him. Now the word chastening right here is correction. Correction by education. Done through words and communication. Despise not when you are corrected by the Lord. How do we feel about correction? Nowadays as believers, how does correction actually come? Correction may show up, husband and wife, correction may show up through your spouse. Your spouse may say, honey, I don't think we should be doing that. And it hits you and you know in your spirit, the Lord. That you've overlooked that thing and now the Lord has it's hit your spouse's radar and that's a problem. Right? Correction of the Lord. How else does this correction show up? Let me ask you this. Does this correction show up by the Lord touching your finances? No. So now your bills are not getting paid. No. No. Are no. you sure? Positive. You absolutely sure? Positive. Well, I'm going to challenge you on that in just a little bit. I'm going to challenge you on that. Does it show up? You're not listening, so I'm going to give your kids cancer. No. No. Break one of them legs. No. No. Are you right, sure? Yeah. No, the correction of the Lord shows up through words and instruction. Now, where do you hear these words and instruction? Church. Wait a minute. Where's the first place you hear the word. it? The word. The word and what else? The inner witness. The inner witness. Typically, before I say it in church, the Lord has already been dealing with you at home. He's already dealt with you in your private time, but you don't want to hear it. You don't, you don't, you reason against it, right? Now, does it happen in church? The Bible says that God actually called the pastor. He said the ministry is profitable for correction and even rebuke. Ladies and gentlemen, church is where you are corrected. Can you deal with that? Woo, now listen, listen before you get to shouting. How does this show up in church? Because if it's done in the form of words and education or instruction, then that means it's happening whenever words, education, and instruction is taking place in the church, right? That's through the preaching. That's through whatever ministry head is sanctioned by that church, giving instruction, the gifts of the Spirit manifesting. Now, notice what he says about this instruction. That when you receive it, don't do what? Don't despise it. Now, come on in here. Don't think little of it. Don't ignore it. Don't become offended by it. Paul says here with these people, you've forgotten how this works. So these people he's writing to are people that were doing just that. 
when they were being corrected, now as believers, they despised it. And you see, this happened all throughout the New Testament. In the beginning of the some of Paul's ministries, the people wanted to cut out their eyes for Paul because they saw the miracle working power in his ministry. They wanted to make him like a god. They held him like he was a god. And then those same people later on wanted to actually kill him. Church people, born again, saved people, wanted to see the man of God dead. How does that happen? Despising the correction. God has ordained an avenue for a good portion of correction to come through. You know where that strongest avenue is? His word. The inner witness. And your fellowship. Did you get that? Now look what he says in the text. Don't faint when you are corrected. When the Lord points out to you that here's a hard one. I've been, I've been through this. Here's a hard one. When you realize you have made the same mistake over and over and over in a particular area. People are telling you the alarm in the inner witness in you is going off of you. Ding, 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 ding. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Danger, Will, Will Robinson. Something's wrong. Right? And then the results that you get in the area of pursuit often ends up the same way. Folks, correction is coming and we're not listening to it. We're despising it. And as a result, you do this. You keep going around the same... Now, it's interesting why you keep going around this same mountain. You'll keep praying. <laughs> You'll keep confessing. You'll keep praying in tongues. You'll even keep shouting and dancing. Glory be to God. You'll keep coming to church. You'll keep declaring the word to people. But after a while, you get dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta be still. I done walked around that thing ten times and ain't just something made that something's wrong. Now, you can't be sensitive concerning correction. You've got to embrace correction. Because correction is not designed to destroy you. Correction is to get you to change course so that you can get manifestation, get results. You see, the enemy is built up in, in the flesh that somehow you're less than if you need to be corrected. Whenever I'm looking for leaders, whatever leaders have a problem with being collect, corrected, that's how I know who my leader is not supposed to be. Lead, godly leaders are not afraid of or bothered by being corrected. On the contrary, they look forward to it. Godly leaders aren't overly concerned about being embarrassed or being told they need to change. They sincerely want to learn and want to grow and want to get results. That means there's no pride there. See, pride doesn't like to be corrected. Wow. Pride does not like to be corrected. It does not to like to look like it's wrong or that you've missed it, right? Yeah. Ah, man, I tell you what, the enemy is, is fighting this thing, trying to get this out. I'm almost done. I got to get this out. Now, let me say this. Look at verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he what? Chasteneth and scourgeth every son 
whom he receives. Watch this. Correction are only for the covenant qualified individual. This kind of correction from God is only for the covenant qualified individual. As long as you are still being corrected, you are still qualified to receive the benefits of the covenant. Wow, that's good. Did you get that? Amen. When you get outside of that correction, the covenant Blessing does not work for you anymore. You know, in church, let me tell you what. I came up old school. If the man of God decreed something over my life that I knew was right, that I was guilty of, that meant something to me. You know, nowadays in, in the body of Christ, the mentality is there's no reverence for the things that God has set up. The people approach the pastors like, man, who are you? Man, I do, I'm grown. I do what I want to do. Terrible attitude, terrible way in the kingdom. The kingdom is still real. It's still, it's still in authority. It does not work like that. I knew, I was taught from the beginning of being born again that I needed to make sure I was well in the spirit of my pastor. I was conscious of making sure I honored my leadership at all times. No matter what church I was at. I had a profound respect for leadership. I did not dismiss what they said. I respected them as unto the Lord. And the Lord honored that in my life. I'm a pastor today because of that being in me. Now, there is a abuse that has taken place in the body of Christ. Don't get me wrong. And even when that abuse has taken place through the leadership, Here's what you've got to know. It is not your job or my job to correct them. Whose job is it to correct them? The Lord's and their authority figures, who they report to. The members in the church have not been given the job to correct their leaders. Did you get that? Are you still here yet? Or have you gone home? Yeah. Home, wasn't he? Yeah. He was razzled down. He was messed up. Lost his anointing and everything. But David knew better than to touch God's anointing. The office is holy even if the person no longer is. That is spiritual law. And it almost makes me cringe. I'm like, I'm almost scared to be around people that talk bad about pastors. Yeah. Yep. I don't care what's going on. Man, listen. Listen to me, AWOFC. You never, ever, under any circumstances, put your mouth negatively on a pastor. Yep. Never. If you have done it, folks, repent. You can go 20 years trying to get a breakthrough and it'd be hindered because of that. Yeah. Repent. Dig it up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Don't be prideful. Like, oh, and I could do No, 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 no. That's the world's way of doing things. That's not how it operates over here in the kingdom. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you need to be interested in finding out Especially when you have the privilege of being close enough to your pastor. I'm not just talking about this church, even people online, where you're in a ministry of that's building and you've been privileged enough to be a part of the core group and the leadership. You need to be concerned about what your pastor has to say about what's happening in your life. Amen. You don't ignore the counsel 
of the anointing when you're that up close and personal with it. I tell you what, that pastor, when you're close to him, that pastor that's anointed, he's going to have an anointing to see into the lives of the people that are walking with him. He's going to be able to see where you are. He's going to be able to help you make adjustments, but if you resent it, if you despise it, you're going to be in trouble. Listen, when, when you are corrected, you can't afford to get mad. It could be, I could say, you know, uh, when I was a musician, I really struggled with it because it just seems like the pastors just live to call the musicians out. Glory be to God. Every time you turn around, pastor would be like, uh, just something back then, it was really rough when it just turned around and be like, too loud, you're too loud. Here you up here, you in the spirit, glory be to God. You've just given your all to the Lord. They turn around for the whole church, you too loud. Now, did they say it in the best way? Maybe not. But was I too loud? Yes. Why? Because it's his church. He's God's man. He is sensitive to the anointing. When he tells me to, to, to turn it down, you know what I do? You turn it down. After he leaves, do you turn it back up? No, you keep it down. Even after he does walk away, you keep it down. That's respect. Now, if you faint is when you do this. When you catch an attitude, go home with your spouse. Go home with your family members and talk about, did you hear the way he talked to me? Did you hear the way he handled me? What kind of man does that? What kind of pastor does that? That is totally ungodly. That's that you get to quote scriptures and everything. <laughs> scriptures that don't have nothing to do with what you're even talking about, too. Do you see how the flesh will make a fool out of you in that regard? No, 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 no. The author and perfecter of your faith can see that. Okay. Let me, I better... Don't throw nothing at me. I'll move. I'll move willingly. Now watch this. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Whom the Lord is in covenant with, he corrects. Let me say this, this little thing right here. I remember my grandfather said years ago, and we had never seen anything like this. But you know, my grandfather's overseen pastors for years and years and years and years. And one day there was a girl that would come to church and she would be sort of with the Lord for a period of time and then she'd not come to church for months and she's back out in the world and whatever. One day she came to church and asked to pray and I heard the bishop say, he said, do not pray for her. There's no more prayer for her. She's done. Don't you know, shortly after, that woman went right back out in the world and got killed. Went right back out and died. It's something about, and I don't mean to make this spooky, but it's something about when you move yourself out of correction. There is a lack of safety there. You're not safe. You know, it's like, you hear me say at times, I say, listen, my niece and my nephew better not do it. And you know why I say that? Because I don't have the jurisdiction over anybody else's child, anyone else's kids. You're in my, my jurisdiction I'm reciprocating concerning your life, right? I'm providing for you, and proof that I'm providing for you is that I'm exercising correction and jurisdiction in your life. Now, when I'm no longer correcting you, what does that mean? You're outside of my jurisdiction. You see? You don't ever want to be outside of correction in the body of Christ. 
even myself as a pastor today, I have people that I'm connected to that I have given permission to say, Pastor Al, you need to consider this. This is something you want to look at. This is something you may want to do or not do. You see what I mean? Yeah. You don't ever put yourself in a place, and this is the danger of not having a church. When you don't have a church, you are essentially rogue. In the text, in verse 8, here's what it calls that person. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye what? Bastards, Bastards and not sons. The inference here in terms of sons are covenant entitled individuals. The covenant does not work when you are outside of correction. You'll see the hardest time a person has, you'll see the people always, and this is the body of Christ worldwide, man, the people that will not submit under leadership anywhere always struggle the most. Always. There's no way around it. I think, personally, folks, I think that is a dangerous thing for any believer to not be submitted to a ministry somewhere. And that's with understanding that times have changed. And again, we have a lot of folks that, or folks that join us online. Listen, even if you're joining us online, you, it's good to watch the videos, but where are you submitted? Is it AWOFC? If it is, you're on the record concerning that. Make sure it's understood, I am an online member of Anointed Word of Faith Church. Who is your pastor? Everybody should be able to say that you have a pastor. And it shouldn't be a secret that that is your pastor. Now, pastors have the responsibility to receive and not receive. For example, um, we had, and I won't get into much detail about this, had a person that came to this church that was a member of another church, all right, in ministry at another church, came to, had backslid and left the Lord, came to this church, received a word of knowledge concerning a uh, 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 word of knowledge, and as a result, the person got healed, raised up off their deathbed uh, in the hospital, got restored and went back to the Lord. Naturally, what do you think the person tried to come to church to? to hear where they heard the word. And when they came, you know what we told them? Go back to your church. Go back. When? Now. Why can't I be here? You can't. You go back to your church. Now, if that person went back to that church, talked to that pastor, and that pastor gave a, gave a letter saying that I released this person to my church, this person has my blessing, then we can receive them. But otherwise, I bring in the curse right here in this church. See, God is a God of order. Yes, We're not on our own down here. We don't just make up the rules as we go and do what we want to do. We follow the rule book down here. You see what I mean? So it is not a small matter. And you need to know this. My job is to equip you for the work of the ministry you need to know the difference with healthy Christianity and unhealthy Christianity. Now, again, this is not to beat up on people for not coming to church, especially not coming to this church. It's not about even what church you're going to. The issue is you need to be submitted somewhere. You need a shepherd. No believer authorized to live the Christian lifestyle without a shepherd. Nobody. And you'll see pe and those kind of people, you understand when you do that, you those people will destroy churches, man. I've seen them destroy churches. Even when I had, was back before, I, I would have guns 
on people, <laughs> you know, the, uh, guns, selling drugs. I mean, doing all kind of stuff in the clubs, all kind of stuff. But I would walk in the church on that Sunday morning, and that anointing was still attached to me. And the people there would see it. And the leaders would be like, hey, brother, minister a word to us. And you know what my response would be? No, sir, don't believe I'll be doing that. <laughs> believe I'll keep my seat. See, I understood order. I'd been taught that. Just because you can don't mean you're authorized to do it. Prophesy, prophecy. I don't know why I'm on this. This must be important. Glory be to God. I didn't plan to go here. But prophecy. We don't receive prophecy from any and everybody. Do you understand that? We judge prophecy. We've had prophecy take place in this church where the prophecy that came out right after the Lord said, Al, that was a curse. Break it. And the people could actually think they're prophesying of the Lord. No, they prophesied. Jeremiah talks about how the prophets got over into prophesying what was in their own heart, not what the Lord said. Bill Winston had a person come to church one day and stood up and said, this church stood up and prophesied and said, this church has gone as far as it can go. God said it cannot grow beyond this, can't go any further. Got up and said that out in the church. Now, I want to give you a heads up. That ever happens in this church, we are going to challenge it together immediately. Yeah. We're going to do exactly what he did. Yeah. He got up and told everybody to turn to him. I'm paraphrasing and broke that thing and said, in Jesus' name, we don't receive it. We send it back. Broke that thing. You see that? Now... The gifts of the Spirit, when a person gets over into prophesying or walking in the gifts of the Spirit in the church that he or she attends, there is a qualifying process before that person is turned loose to do so. Here is the number one qualifier that that person's lifestyle matches the word. I can't, I can't, I can't sleep around and have a one night stand on Saturday night and prophesy Sunday morning, folks. Are you okay with that? I don't care how sincere you are. I struggled with that when I first started preaching. Where I was at, all the preachers, all of us young preachers, man, because in the organization we were in, you weren't anything, it seemed, unless you were a preacher. So we all had gifts and anointings, and naturally the only outlet we had to express our gifts with the Lord, the only avenue that was open there was preaching. And I try to really hard to make sure that preaching is not the only outlet here in this church. That there are multiple, we're always trying to create multiple areas for people to serve in. Well, we, what I noticed is that we all, the majority of the young preachers, especially the guys, we all struggled, man. We all struggled. I mean, people had just, just the craziest lust issues and, and all kind of stuff. But what you learn to do is to try to patch yourself up right before it was time for you to preach. And one day, probably one of the best things ever happened to me, I had a prophet, a pastor of a denomination, he was an apostle actually, of a denomination. He sat me down and looked me in my eyes. He said, Brother Al, the time to be free from sin has already passed for you. You don't get free in the ministry. You get free before you come into ministry. Now, that was monumental to us because we figured it was just a struggle. We were struggling, and God understood our struggle, so we would just keep working on it. And one day, we would just 
be free. Glory be to God. But no, no, no. It doesn't work that way. That needs to be dealt with first. So there is a reverence when it comes to how things operate in the house of God. There is a standard how you need to live. You know, uh, one church, one of our partners, the pastor says that before we receive a person over into certain aspects of ministry in the church, that we go to their house unannounced to see how they're living when they didn't expect us to come. Can you imagine that, Pastor Albert, showing up at your door? Hello! How you doing today, my brother? My sister? Here's the line. You know, if I come, I'm going to come and shout and everything. I'm going to act super churchy when I come to your house. So if you got somebody that ain't churchy, you're going to be razzle-dazzle. Got somebody in there that's supposed to be in there, I'm going to be razzle-dazzle. Like, oh, glory be to God. I'm going to talk to you like you just sold up saved in front of the person that ain't saved. That's how I'm going to treat you. Now, if I don't think it's even necessary to consider being concerned about anything you're doing, now that's another problem. That means you're out of my jurisdiction. And if you're out of my jurisdiction, you better get in somebody's jurisdiction. Yeah. We have not been called only to sit at home and be holy. Now, again, don't go out and start taking me out of context saying pastors fussing about people that don't come to church. I am simply saying if you can go to church you are absolutely supposed to, period. Amen. No in between. Amen. You cannot be but so holy if you don't go to church, if you're not submitted under correction somewhere. Do you receive that? Amen. If, if you receive it, if you can't receive it, say, oh, me. And if you can't say, oh, me, say, oh, my, because it's true anyhow. It's true anyhow. There is a standard, glory be to God. Now, when you're being corrected, don't get mad. Take it. You know in this church, if I haven't corrected you, then our love is still developing. You've been corrected here, right? I've told you at times, under the Holy Ghost, directly to your face, this is a problem you need to change. Some of it is done secretly, and some of it is not. You know why? Because the Lord dictates that. Some of us, if the Lord didn't bring it out in the open, we would hide forever. There would be no motivation to change. The church is the hospital. You don't, this is not where we hide. We come in to the emergency room saying, I'm wounded. Do you got some assistance for me? Do you see that? Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise for that. Hallelujah. Let me close with this verse right here and be done. Verse 11, and I know, I apologize, I know I've gone a little longer today than what I should have. I apologize for that, and I didn't intend to, but if it wasn't here, if you were up here, you would, you'd probably do the same thing. If you, you feel what I feel, what I get hit with, I'm telling you. Verse 11, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. <laughs> what do you think about that? Man. Correction? It's okay, ladies and gentlemen. It's okay that it doesn't feel good. Quit concluding 
that if you're corrected in a way that doesn't feel good, that the correction is wrong. You understand that? The man just volunteered to, you know, in this millennial generation, the narrative is totally different. The indoctrination is totally different. It has set up in multiple places, in the workplace, in church, in school. It is, the enemy is trying to create a society where correction is not allowed. You're not allowed to spank your kids. Kids, they don't need to be abused, but guess what? They need spanking sometimes. Uh-oh, let me see. I see you. It happens. It happens. The Bible says folly is bound up in the heart of a child. And if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. If you don't discipline them, they're going to be a problem. And it's going to be your fault. You're going to have to answer to it. Now, does it doesn't mean that, that it's not a process. It's a process. The moment you take that up and start declaring that on the Lord, that's when the child will start trying you the most, glory be to God. But you stay consistent. You keep your strong hand, glory be to God. <laughs> And you persevere because you love them. My grandmother used to say, she said, when I was a kid, she said, Abba, she said, uh, she said, I don't just beat you for me. I beat you so that other people will love you. <laughs> she said, I got to beat you so other people can deal with you. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but the correction it, at times, it won't feel good, man, because it's never easy to come to grips with a way about yourself. Oftentimes, a way that generally the people that love you could see and that they've told you, but you just refuse to, to listen. You know, you just refuse to listen. And I remember before I got delivered, my brother used to point out to me, like, bro, you're selfish, man. And that used to just make me so mad. <laughs> I mean, when me and my brother would argue, we would argue in a way that it was you really needed to call the police. When we argued, we were that demonstrative that aggressive, it would seem like somebody was going to die. It was that serious. And he would tell me multiple times that I was selfish, that I was selfish. Well, I didn't realize that I had that selfishness thing on me until after I came to the Lord. Didn't even realize it. And when it was pointed out, see, the best way to do is when the Lord corrects you, privately, go ahead and take it then so it doesn't become public. Yeah. Do you get that? Yeah. See, if, if you judge yourself, you won't have need to be judged of the Lord. See? Yeah. He always gives you opportunity and, and I saw this, I saw this in the church, man, play out so much that I found out secret sin. It will always be exposed. Now, if you're sitting in here and that scares you because you've dealt with secret sin, watch what I'm going to do. I promise you it's going to come out. I promise you it's going to come out. If you cover your sins, grace doesn't work. You know, when I got delivered, out of all the things I was doing, I got delivered. You know what I did? I told my wife every single bit of it. Everything. Every bit of it. See, when you get over into secrecy, 
that's where the enemy really will destroy your life. When you are doing secret things like you can't, you are the child of the light. You don't live secretly. You live in the light. You need to confess that thing and you need to get in so you can move. Well, the consequences, you're already suffering consequences. And those consequences are going to get worse at some point. You're not saving face. Do you understand that? I needed to be told this as a young Christian. But I was so gifted in the church that they would try to do the best they could to conceal my sin so that I could still keep the program going. You see what I mean? They would just try to, you know, silence me here. They didn't really, I, I was never really confronted in the way I needed to be confronted. Like, dude, this is not good. This is the problem already on the table. There should, you should not be, listen, I know people think that in the faith church, people think we don't have standards. Why is that? Do I preach that way? Do I preach to give you the impression that it's not okay that you fornicate? It's not okay. Christians, newsflash, don't fornicate. Did you know that? No, it's not excusable. No, it's not too much to expect. Believers don't fornicate. Believers don't cheat on their spouses. Believers, don't watch pornography. This is not what we do. Now, does it mean that it does not happen? We know it happens. But we're not going to call wrong right. When we're wrong, we're going to admit that we're wrong. And we're going to come boldly to the throne of grace to receive mercy and what? Help so that we can get back up. But we're not going to continue to act as though prosperity is going to work for us while we are breaking the covenant. You cannot persist in sin and think the blessing will still work. If for no other reason, your heart will condemn you. Is that hard to hear? Ooh, it's quiet in there, Jesus. Now, again, this is not to condemn you, but it's to cause you to think sober-minded concerning these things. The last person you want to be lying to is yourself. And this is across the board, folks. This is across the board. We live honorably. Do you get that? If you have a a girlfriend and you're a believer, men, you have a girlfriend and you're a believer, you should not be sleeping with that girl. Women, you have a boyfriend and you are saved, you are not supposed to be sleeping with them. Under any circumstances, Paul said, let it not be once among you. Not even one time. Nowadays, it's like, well, look, well, I just got, I need at least 10 times a day. No, no, no. None. It's not supposed to happen. This shouldn't be a scary subject in the church. This should be liberating in the church. You should be liberated because you are empowered over these things. Come out of the closet, man. Come out of the closet. You know, every one of these sin is a gateway. It's gateway. Do you know statistically, and wow, Lord, are you sure this is where you want me to go with all of this? Statistically, do you know that the vast majority of Christian men are either currently involved in homosexuality or have had homosexual experiences at some point in their life? The vast majority of men in the church, women too, it's not just the men, women too, The, the Spirit of God is attracted to honor, folks. We're, we're not just playing, church. 
there's real power in the church. There is power to walk right. There is power to talk right. There is power to do. And what you got to do is you got to keep the rules. Now, we're talking about correction. This is correction. You keep the rules. But when you're dating, and I always say this to dating couples, you don't date like you're married. You don't date like you're married. There is a separation. We don't move in together until we get married. There is no, well, this will be my future spouse, so let me go ahead. It's okay if we sleep together now, because after all, we are going to get married. No, 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 no. You get married. What is bound on earth is bound in heaven. What is made official in the earth is backed by heaven. Do you see that? You know, they used to tell us in the church, in the holiness church, about being on the devil's territory. I was a young Christian. Man, it was unthinkable for me to be dating a saved woman and us to spend the night at each other's houses while we were dating unbelievers. Now, that the very suggestion that you shouldn't do that is like archaic, barbaric even. Barbaric. Now, I'm not making that a law, but I'm saying if you are in close physical proximity consistently with the person you are dreaming about one day going to bed with, it's probably going to go down. Yeah. The Bible says, shun the very appearance of evil. Make no provisions. Can anybody finish that verse? For the flesh. For the flesh. Don't make provisions. I pulled up to the window and the lady says, she says, uh, wow, you smell really good. You know, I got that good cologne. You know, that good cologne. And where it's at. Thank the Lord. Now, I found me what I'm keeping it to. And uh, she was like, you smell really good. And inst instinctually, you know what I do? Did you, did you, did you catch it? What I do? I'm married. Put that ring out there, glory be to God. You know what she said? She said, where's your wife at? I said, she's at church waiting on me right now. Yeah. You know, the devil will get her. He said, well, tell her I said her husband smell good. I said, loose him, devil, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Jesse Duplantis was on a flight. Jesse Duplantis was on a flight, and uh, he ended up sitting down a commercial flight, and this girl comes up to him. And a uh, really attractive woman, I guess, and, sits beside him and says uh, something of the nature. She said, um, wow, we could really, she advanced him like, we can do this, we can go here and let's go do this, yada, yada, yada. And on the, <laughs> on the airline, in front of the whole airline, you know what he said? Anybody heard this story? Outline said, whore Babylon, whore Babylon. <laughs> on the flight in front of all the people. And you know what he said about that? He said, you better make a fool out of sin or sin will make a fool out of you. Yeah. Chelsea and I, we learned at the beginning when we got delivered because we both had so much lust on us before that we came into agreement after we got delivered that the glory of God would be around us and that it would serve as a repellent to keep people from lusting after us. And it took some time, but we kept declaring it. And if it ever gets out of pocket, then, that, then we know we've got to change what we're saying. That thing starts to pick back up. People start to get that way. We've got to change what we're saying. We've got to get right back on our faith. Uh uh Glory be to God. The glory of God is on my spouse. They're only looked at as honorable people. Glory be to God in the name of Jesus. They're looked at as honorable. They're respected in the name of Jesus. They're not manipulated. Glory be to God. You know, you'll have people in the church that 
you have women that come to church and doesn't have any issue about trying to sleep with all the men in the church and men that are trying to sleep with all the women in the church. These things are abnormal in the body of Christ. Glory be to God. I don't care where it's been done. It's not supposed to be done. It's a problem. It is not to be tolerated in any way. Amen. You hold yourself accountable. You hold each other accountable. No way you should be hanging out with your brother and sister of the Lord that comes to church with you every Sunday. You know they're sleeping together and you've never said anything to them. Are you kidding me? What are you talking about? That is a problem. You are a part of the problem. That's not love. Love doesn't mind its own business. That's what the world does. Love just gets in and tells on everything. Exposes everything. And when you get exposed, you know what you do? You accept it. And you make the change. Now, I'm not saying that's anybody in here. Don't, don't get to wondering, well, you know, who's pastor talking about it? Yada, yada, don't, don't, don't get over into any of that. But I'm telling you, these are the standards. This level of correction is going to become necessary going forward because the enemy is applying pressure to the body of Christ, man. You're not going to be able to just say that you're a Christian. You're going to have to show and represent a difference. If you're a believer, you're going to have to really look like one. You're going to really have to live like a believer. Forget about this, this lukewarm place. Let's not live there. Let's live up here on the mountain, glory be to God. Let's live up here in victory. Thank you, Lord. Now listen, I don't care if you are in infraction to one of the things I named. You do not have to stay there. Come out right away. Stop hiding. Come out. You cannot get helped if you're hiding. If you're thinking that you're just going to secretly, I'm talking about consistent, repetitive, immoral sin. If you are practicing that secretly, you will not get free secretly. You are going to have to tell it. You're going to have to tell it. If we confess our sin. He's what? He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse it. You've got to confess to the Lord, and in certain cases, you need to confess to people. Typically, authoritative people in the body of Christ that the Lord has placed in your life. Now, if you're not under authority in no church, that's why you can't think of nobody to go tell because you don't care. Because you're not under authority anywhere. You just do you. And if that's the case, if you've been there, the answer for you is you just need to repent and be restored. You're in a place of broken fellowship. You need to get fellowship restored. You're comfortable with sinning because you have broken fellowship. That's why you're comfortable with sinning. Don't put yourself in the category of a person that's trying to do what's right and you keep messing up. No, 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 no. You are in a state of broken fellowship with the Lord, and that's why practicing sin is a part of your lifestyle. So I'm not talking to you. You're not in secret. That's who you really are right now. If you want to get out of that, you need to repent and ask the Lord to restore you and start walking in the word. Does that make sense? Come on, let's stand. Let's give the Lord a praise. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. You can shout over it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory be to God. Well, Lord, don't worry about it. I'm not here to call anybody out for anything. Not today. Glory be to God. Instead, I'm going to show you how to repent. The Bible says that if we confess our sin, he is faithful, committed, and legally obligated by blood to forgive us and cleanse us from the unrighteousness associated with whatever you've done. 
And I'm telling you, no matter how far you've gone, no matter the depths of how far you've missed it, the road forward is shorter than the road behind you. The way to recovery is much quicker than the road you've been on. So if you've been in this place, the road you've been on is a long, long road. The enemy will try to tell you that if I repent, some, if I acknowledge it, if I come out, somehow I'm destroying my life. Or somehow I'm exposing my, no, 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 no. Until you come out, your life is already halted. That blessing already won't work on you until you come out. So you start by repenting. And you repent by faith, not by how you feel. You just repent by faith and say, Lord, I, uh, and you call out what it is. Lord, I've done this. That's me. I've been doing this. Lord, forgive me. And cleanse me from the unrighteousness associated with this. Now, I believe by faith and I take my forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, that right now, I don't care what the details are. I don't care what needs to be fixed about this situation. Right now, I repent Forgive me, and I take it right now in Jesus' name. Well, I'm telling you, that moment you are forgiven right then and there. Once you do that, then the blessing starts going to work on your life to reverse anywhere the enemy has gained a foothold in your life. Whatever consequences you are running towards, you're not running towards now. Glory be to God. GPS is being performed on your situation, causing you to get a better end than you ever dreamed possible. Glory be to God. You're coming out, and you're going to be better than you ever were before. Lord, cleanse me from the unrighteousness associated with this thing. I take it. I have it now in the name of Jesus. By faith, I receive it, not by feeling, not by how I feel. I do this by faith, not by sight. I'm not judging whether or not I should repent based off of what my natural situation looks like. I'm not judging it by that. I'm sticking to the word in this one. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory be to God. Lord, we just receive correction all over the house, Lord. Uh, every issue in the house is not an issue of immorality, Lord. And some places, Lord, we've stepped out of love. And some places, Lord, you've been telling us to go right and we've been going left. Well, we receive that correction. We see, Lord, that we've been going around the same mountain. Show us how to make that adjustment, Lord. We receive it right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that correction. And because this word is being preached to me today, I am still qualified. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're not disqualified because of the hearing of this word. We are qualified in Jesus' name. We're loved. We're sons. We're not outside of the covenant. Glory be to God. You don't deal with people outside of the covenant this way. You deal with those whom you love this way in Jesus' name. Yeah. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. We are already those that walk after the Spirit. There is no guilty verdict against us. You love us. Good to us. Our Lord, we thank you for these things. And we take it. And we have it now. In Jesus' name.
Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise if you receive it. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Come on, come on. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Coroneliabo sacarete. Mosandele corodaliambo so coronda. I just I release over you a peace to transition. Those of you that need to come out, come out. It starts today. You need to admit it today. Come out. You leave here today. You need to bring an end to it today. It is here in the house. Leave it today. Walk in the newness of life in this area today. Do you receive that? Amen. Walk out of it today. Don't stay in hiding anymore. You don't have to hide because you're loved of the Lord. The Lord will not disqualify you. He will restore you. You do not have to hide. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Good plans and good things is what the Lord has for you. Not bad things. To do good to you, not to harm you. Maria Cora said, you want the real blessing operating in your life. You don't want a counterfeit. You want the real blessing operating on you, don't you? Well, you got to be honest with the Lord. Can't hide. You got to be honest with him. Amen? Amen? Now, listen, let me say this. Cut that camera, my brother. <laughs>